All right, and welcome again to Questions and Answers with Father Stephen. We finally know what to call this segment. Uh, we have been changing the, the names of the segment every time we film. I, we hope you're doing well back there. We miss you here at the parish. We continually pray for you. And uh, we look forward to resuming Masses soon, God willing. We don't know when, but they will. Right, Father? Hopefully soon, yes. Yeah. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Yeah, and it's very, it's a very good day for a long question with a lot of answers, Father. Are you ready? Yeah, I guess so. All right. Uh, I'm going to read the question, and um, I guess later we just dissect, because it's one of those questions that has many questions in it, okay? How would you respond to a young person who says that the Catholic Church today is out of touch, old-fashioned, not relevant to society? As an adult living in a largely secular society, I often find it hard to talk about my faith in my workplace. How much harder would it be for a young person to be a witness of their faith in their social circle? I know praying at home as a family is important, but I'd rather have my kids develop a true relationship with Christ than insist that we pray the rosary together every day just as a ritual. As an adult Catholic, I have come to believe that my faith and worship does not have to be entertaining and self-control and sacrifice are important to become spiritually mature. But many young people are growing up in a society that places importance on the opposite, high stimulation, self-reliance, pride itself, self-acclaim, pursuit of whatever makes them happy. I believe that young people today ask more questions than that is, and that is very good. And if given the opportunity, we seek to know more about faith. What books, apps would you recommend for teens to capture and hold their interest in the Catholic faith? Thank you. Well, there is a lot there, Father, and it's a very, um, it's a very hot topic. I think many people mm -hmm. in the church have been talking about it lately. Not lately, but in the last couple of years, right? Mm -hmm. um, we recently saw a survey saying. That that the fastest growing uh, religion in the United States is the nuns, which is the N-O-N-E, people who are non-religious. It's a huge majority of youth mm -hmm. which are integrated in this group. Yeah. And many of them are former Catholics. Right? Yeah, statistics also show that youth in their early 20s tend to fall away from the practice of their faith. So once they go to university, once they get older, they're more kind of on their own. They, they fall away from the practice of the faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, th the youth are tomorrow's future, whether you think of it for society or for the church. So think of John Paul II, St. John Paul II, his love of the youth. He started the, the World Youth Days, trying to get youth together. And he kind of understood that youth need to be influenced by one another because as i mentioned so many times before peer pressure on youth is extremely great and because of that youth are more easily influenced by the trends that are taking place in society or among their peers and if they don't have a good uh, peer support group they're just going to follow uh, what's happening in society and go with the flow so yeah uh, in, in regards to this question, there's a lot in here and um, hopefully it won't take us too long to address it all. But, you know, even in the very first sentence, this person is asking, uh, you know, how do you respond to a young person who says that the Catholic Church is out of touch, old fashioned, not relevant to society? And, and I think we can emphasize not relevant to young people. So I have a question for you, Roberto. You're much younger than I am. Oh, geez. So okay. Maybe I'm out of touch with the youth, but okay. what would you say is relevant to young people today? What are their interests? So not I don't mean Catholic youth, but in youth in general, what is it that interests youth today? Um, I would say um, video games. Video games. Electronics. Yeah. And clothing. clothing, surprisingly, they really enjoy clothing. Okay. 
Uh, they actually talk about clothing too, which is interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, different apps, maybe? Yeah. Apps, um, movies, movies, Netflix. Things that are entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. Attractive, flashy, yeah. colorful. So, okay. So, you mentioned video games, uh, clothing. What was the other one? There was one. Um, electronics. Electronics, music. Uh, music, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, I would say those are the main things. Um, but that's my perception. I feel that I'm older. I sometimes... Yeah, you're not, yeah. You're not as young. Probably YouTube. You're, you're certainly not a teenager. YouTube. That, 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 you're, yeah. you're younger than I am, yeah. YouTube, Instagram, yeah. TikTok. Okay. Yeah. So when it comes to video games, I think for especially for, for men or boys, they, they love a challenge. But it's also entertaining. It also occupies your time, gives you a full sense of purpose. But a lot of what we talked about is kind of entertaining things. So music, uh, YouTube, Netflix, some of these types of things. So a lot of entertainment, self-gratification. So I think if people, young people are looking for these things, are they going to find these things in the church? No, probably not. We have created games, uh, religious type games, you know, kind of like uh, Monopoly, but it's Catholic based and things like that, but it, it tends not to appeal. So a lot of young people, they want fast, instant entertainment, a lot of variety, a lot of noise even, you know. The, yeah. trash, the, tech, I mean, the attention span of a person, a young person nowadays is very, very short. Um, even uh, the reading abilities are very limited nowadays because they don't read books as we used to. At and least also their writing ability. It's very, very limited because yeah. some of them don't write anymore. I remember just text. they text them. Mm -hmm. I remember once I was, when I was a teacher, I asked a student, do you type or write better? And then he stared at me and he said, well, I actually rather text. So he doesn't type well either. <laughs> mm. So, yes. But what I want to say, the point that I want to make here is it's very hard for a person that age, uh, from that age you group, what we call young people, to um, to sit and read in the way we used to. Um, yes. And to properly use more critical thinking. Right. So they have a very short attention span because they're used to constant entertainment and it's designed in such a way that it's constantly gratifying them and it's almost like they become addicted to that and need that. So they have a hard time just sitting still and meditating. Okay. Now, a kind of follow-up on that question is, okay, we know what young people are interested. Part of the reason they're interested in that is because their friends are interested in that also. So if you know, they're playing video games, they talk about it, oh, I got this new game, or they challenge each other, things like that. Okay. Um, why are they interested in these things other than just the fact that their peers are interested also? In other words, there's some level of gratification, is there not? Yeah, I agree. There is gratification, but there is also a very... Um this is a very isolating society. It's very difficult for people to make friends. So you don't want to step on anybody's toes. And I feel that in order to avoid that, you know, people just seek refuge from these things that are very individualistic. Yeah, so people are less social also. Yeah. And in fact, the more isolated they become, the more attached or addicted they become to all these sources of entertainment and, and gratification. And also I feel that the, this is a Robertoism, okay, I haven't read that, I, this is a theory I have. Um, I think we have a brand as a church, and they see the church as a brand, and they relate the brand to something that the mainstream media has sold as negative, dictatorial, um, Old-fashioned, old fashioned, old fashioned, and the late the person I don't know if he's a man or a woman said out of touch, not relevant, and now we have another label in our brand, non-essential. Mm -hmm. So um, since we have so many labels, it's very difficult that a person will purchase an intangible object such as faith with so many negative labels. Mm -hmm. 
And it's the same thing that happens. It's easier to sell popsicles. My mother used to say it's easier to sell popsicles because you can touch them than sell something that you cannot see. And yeah. Yeah, in regards to branding or how the church is pre presented, years ago I had seen a kind of documentary, a video, and they were pointing out that in so many movies, priests are portrayed in a very negative way. Mm -hmm. They were made to look very ugly and it's kind of, it, it was, it, they were pointing out how this kind of propaganda and this, the way they present the church is very negative. And it does have a tremendous impact on youth. Not to say that there aren't some good movies with some good portrayals of priests and nuns, but, but definitely they were showing that there is a trend to kind of portray the church in a very, very bad, negative light. And there's, there's signs to back up the fact that these movies do influence the way people think and often even how they, they vote. So uh, when it comes to certain issues, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. But what I wanted to get at is part of the reason that young people are pursuing all these things is because they believe it's their philosophy for life. In other words, these things are going to make them happy and therefore they are pursuing these things. Correct. So whether someone is aware of this or not, but the ultimate goal or purpose of every human being is to be happy. And so every person is a philosopher who comes up with his or her own idea of, well, how am I going to be happy? But the problem is that philosophers can make mistakes. We make mistakes. So God says, okay, well, I'm going to tell you how you can be happy. You don't have to spend time trying to figure it all out. But even what I'm trying to say is even natural philosophy will agree with pretty much everything that is given to us by God or revealed to us by God. That in order to be happy, we need to have good relationships, we need to love, we need to have self-control so that we can love and not be selfish and not to offend others, but try to be virtuous, to be good. Correct. Okay, so even the ancient philosophers, they, they you know, they talked about leisure, having time and, and the importance of meditation, contemplating the beauty of nature and thinking about God. They were saying that these are things that contribute to happiness. So that's from the point of view of, of like pagan philosophers, not even Christianity. Okay, so if the ultimate purpose of young people today and in every age is happiness, and the ultimate person of every person in the world is happiness, and the church teaches us how to be happy, is the church relevant? And the answer is yes. However, that notion of the church teaching us to be happy is often not emphasized enough or people aren't aware of it enough. So why do we, you know, why do we come to church or is the church all about just how we're going to celebrate the liturgy? Is it just about... The way with rats. <laughs> yeah, or things like that. No, it's ultimately about happiness. We want to be happy now, but we also want to be happy for all eternity. Is this relevant to youth, yes or no? Do young people want to be happy? Absolutely. Right? There is a... Um, there is a happiness that is intangible. We cannot really touch it because the happiness that I see in the world nowadays is based on things that they can see and touch. Uh, it's very haptic. It's related to what we can touch. Mm -hmm. um, Video game, video games is what I can see. I receive it. I can touch it. I can, yeah. pop, I can move it. But the the happiness in Christ is intangible. We cannot actually touch it, but it, but we can feel it in our heart. Now, how we can understand it? I think the person who asked that was this question said something that makes a lot of sense. Uh, she says. Or he says, I, I, would like, I would rather have my kids develop a true relationship with Christ. And it's true. It's very important to develop a truthful relationship with Christ. But how to do it, it's, um, it's what really becomes the challenge. Because it's not just saying, I'm a Catholic. It's what Pope Francis says with your example. Demonstrate what your happiness looks like. Because you are, you belong to a, a religion like the Catholic Church. That's very different. However, the person also says something else, but I will let you go ahead, Father, and then we continue mm. answering this question. Well, I'm glad you brought up the issue of a happiness that is not tangible. 
but it is a happiness that we experience. And often when I teach the young people, especially in confirmation, I ask them the question, what's the difference or is there a difference between the phrase being happy and having fun? So think about that, being happy, having fun. And a lot of young people will, will say there's no difference, but there is a difference. So what is being happy? And I tell them, focus on the first word in both phrase, being, having. So being happy means it's an internal thing that you possess. It's part of your being. It's a state of being. I'm content. I am happy whether I am having fun or not because I'm satisfied with myself as a person. Having fun is an experience, something that's temporary. It's not uh, a lasting thing like being happy. It's, it's an experience. So when you're with your friends, you feel happy, you're having fun, but is that necessarily going to make you happy? Well, if you have good friends, it will contribute to your happiness, yes. But being happy is a state, and how do we acquire that state? And I talk about that. You know, what are the different criteria to be happy? If, if we took God out of the picture and we were able to produce an ideal life for a person, what are the criteria that would be, need to be there to make the person happy? Mm -hmm. And I go through this list with them, and they mention many things, but one of them is having a purpose, having love, to love and to be loved. Um, you know, uh, being uh, useful, doing good things to others. I mean, many, many things. It's a long list. We don't have time to go through it all. But the point I wanted to make is a lot of people mistake the two. Having fun and being happy is not the same thing. Those things that enable you to have fun, some of them are okay. It's good for us to have fun. I like to have fun. Some of that contributes to our happiness. But there's many things that are considered fun and enjoyable that don't make you happy and in fact take away your happiness. But the problem is that young people think that having fun is the same as being happy and so they just want to have fun. They want to be experiencing something all the time. And I give the, the analogy, think of a student, he goes home after school, does his homework and then enjoys himself a little bit and the person who doesn't like doing homework or doesn't want to do it and just wants to have fun, they go out and play, they play video games, they waste their time, they don't get their homework done. In the long run, the student who is more studious and self-disciplined gets a good job and because of that um, has a higher salary and, and is able to live well and have a cottage and a boat and whatever he wants. He can enjoy himself later in life. He has a family. The person who doesn't discipline themselves, doesn't do their homework, they're not going to get good marks, less likely to get a good job, they're going to be struggling later on, they're not going to be able to enjoy their lives later on. Why is there such a, an epidemic or, uh, of, of people on drugs? Why are young people turning to drugs? Because they're not happy. What do drugs do? They kind of make you feel good, right? Isn't that true? So why are there more and more young people turning to drugs? Partially because it's a socially accepted norm. Their peers are doing it, but also it's kind of an escape from reality and it just kind of allows you to feel good, but it doesn't mean that you are good. And true, a true sense of, of feeling well or happy comes from knowing that we are a good person and we do things well. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I understand that. No, it's good. Um. Yeah, you also mentioned about having a true relationship with Christ. So the person says, I would rather have my kids develop a true relationship with Christ than insist that we pray the rosary together every day just as a ritual. Okay, so yes, having a true relationship with Christ is the most important thing, but it makes it sound like praying the rosary is an obstacle to that or is just a ritual. And yes, it depends on how you view the rosary. So the rosary is something very important, something that has been encouraged by the major apparitions around the world, Lourdes, Fatima, and even way back when the rosary was just in its initial stages, Our Lady recommended it to, to St. Dominic. So the rosary is something that can bring us closer to God, but you're right. You have to have the right attitude towards the rosary. 
And I believe a lot of young people don't. They're just reciting the Hail Marys. Their mind is totally elsewhere. They're not focused on God. They're not making the effort to meditate on the mysteries. Why is it so important to meditate on the mysteries of the rosary? So that we can get to know Christ better too, so that we can get to see him in action or the Blessed Virgin Mary, her yes to God. It should motivate us us to say yes to God, to be the handmaid of the Lord, to do the will of the Lord, because by doing that, it's going to make us happy. You know, Father, with the rosary, I have my personal experience. When I was a kid, I started praying the rosary. Um, I was like five or six years old with my mom. My mom was a full-time worker. She was working during the whole day. And she came home, and then I remember her. She used to wear high heels, right? So she used to take off her high heels and um, immediately rush to her little altar and put us to pray the rosary with her. And I completely hated praying the rosary. I found it completely boring, absolutely senseless, and just the 30 minutes of my time that were wasted, then I would rather use it watching cartoons. At that time, we didn't have cell phones. Right. It was just watching cartoons on TV. Um, and uh, I think the only time when I remember that the rosary was important was when I learned how to meditate the rosary and to close my eyes and use my imagination to see what really happened uh, in that precise moment of the mysterious life of Jesus through the eyes of Mary. Then I started enjoying the rosary more and more. I remember my parish priest saying, oh, well, you know, pray when you are in bed at night because it's the best way to fall asleep. That was the motivation I got from my parish priest to pray the rosary. It was good to fall asleep. So it was like taking a sleeping pill. It's like but boring. Yes. It was very boring. And actually, I really think a lot of people consider not only people who are away or youth or a lot of people who are in the church, even religious people might consider the sorcery very boring. But it's because there is a lack of meditation of the life of Jesus. Even if you don't do it properly, the rosary can be considered something sacrilegious. Not sacrilegious, the word is, um, in the Bible, reciting prayers with no sense like that is no, it's not okay. It's just vain repetition. It's vain repetition. <laughs> now, how to make your kids believe in the rosary or love the rosary is to actually explain why the rosary is important for the meditations of the life of Jesus. In, again, building the relationship of the, the true relationship with Christ. But I think in order to do that, I think um, a person has to first belong or believe, then they will belong and then they can behave. Yeah. And then what I want to say, sorry, uh, what I want to say is the following. Uh, uh, if I don't believe in what, what is preached by the church or by the Lord through the authority of the church, I will not belong to it because I don't buy it. But once I believe and I belong to it, then I can behave. I can change my behavior. I will not get a tattoo or I will not get a piercing in my nose. I don't think I would look good with a piercing here. Yeah. But So it's a process. It's not that things are going to change overnight. Yeah. Uh, getting back to what the person was saying, you know, I would rather have my kids develop a true relationship with Christ than insist we pray the rosary together every day just as a ritual. It almost seems like it's either one or the other, a true relationship with Christ or just a ritual. But in reality, the ritual helps us to have a relationship with Christ. So it's not either or, it's both and it's actually necessary or very beneficial to pray the rosary in order to have a better relationship with Christ and with Our Lady. But yes, you're right, the rosary has to be explained, the person has to have the right attitude. And I think part of the problem with young people is they don't fear death. So a lot of young people there think they're invincible. They don't think the reality, they don't think of the reality of death. They don't think of the reality of heaven and hell. They have this assumption that everybody's gonna go to heaven even if they do think about death. So if a person realizes that hell is real and that they are capable of going there, 
then they're going to need a savior who is Christ and they're going to be more likely to turn to him and want to have a relationship with him. Correct. But unless young people see, well, what's the usefulness of having a relationship with Christ? Because praying the rosary is boring. I'd rather play video games, right? So that's the problem. They don't, they don't understand why they need God, why they need Christ in their life. And, and ultimately it gets back to what I mentioned earlier, our desire for happiness. God wants us to be happy. You may have noticed we have a new image here. So we had the small crucifix here before. Today we have St. Michael the Archangel with his foot on the head of the serpent, the devil. So why do we decide to put it here today to emphasize that in order to be happy, we need to root out sin and sinful inclination in our own lives. We need to root out evil in society also. And this is what will contribute to our personal happiness and the happiness of everyone else. So St. Michael is just one example of someone who does that. In other words, he ought to be the one who inspires us and that we ought to imitate St. Michael in rooting out evil in our lives and asking him to defend us against evil. But this is not a pursuit of young people. Yes, we need to have a goal, we need to have a purpose. Promote the kingdom of God. Root out evil in your own life and in the lives of society or in, in the lives of people in society. Promote the kingdom here on earth. What a wonderful goal. And every person is called to do that, to contribute in some way. Because a lot of people, young people, they think, well, I have no purpose. And then, you know, with the school shut down, they may not get as good marks. What are they going to do? A lot of young people don't even think of their future, what job they're going to do, what occupation, whether they're going to get married or not. They're just kind of going with the flow and following the modern trend and just doing what everybody else is doing. I think the other thing is that um, while I was growing up, there were many empty spots in society, like blank spots there that were always filled by God in the presence of the church. And that was a very great example for me. Um, for instance, the poor was fed, were, were fed, fed by the church through religious sisters, like the Sisters of Charity. And I used to see Mother Teresa on TV with Lady Diana, things like that. So the church was always relevant, was always prevalent. I come from the era of St. John Paul II, when he was still a Pope, and it, it was more of a sense that there was a supernatural in, on the earth represented by the Holy Mother Church. And I don't know if this has been replaced by what the government can do for me, and this are uh, making it you feel that the government will be there all the time, and perhaps it's true. But for, for sure, I know that the only thing that will remain forever with you is God. No matter what, He will always be there. Yeah. Um, notice the person also points out in their question that I have come to believe that faith and worship does not have to be entertaining and self-control and sacrifice are important, definitely. Uh, to become spiritually mature. So young people are not taught self-control or sacrifice today. To a certain extent they are, but uh, especially in, in the Catholic school system, they're taught to care for the poor and things like that, and they donate food and things. So some level of sacrifice, yes, but the importance of self-control, because it's only when we have self-control that we can practice true love in relationships, whether it's in marriage as spouses, or parents towards their children, or even siblings towards one another. Self-control is extremely important. But I wanted to focus on how the person says that faith and worship does not have to be entertaining. And there's been a movement, a trend to entertain both the adults, but especially the youth. So you have these youth masses, these youth bands, you have these youth events where there's a lot of music and noise and, and, and you know, it's very, kind of invigorating. In many ways, it's good, uh, similar to the youth day, World Youth Days, but there's also a lot of good teaching. So some of these entertaining events can attract the youth, but it's important for youth to realize that that's not what it's about. It's not about entertainment. It's about worshiping God. And any kind of worship in any religion, there's ritual involved. And that ritual reminds us that this is something otherworldly. 
there's usually vestments, there's, there's sometimes incense, all these things remind us. But for young people, all these things are boring because they're so used to Netflix and their video games and other things. So it seems that it isn't relevant to them, but it is if they understand why we are doing these things. So it motivates us to have a greater love of God and to truly worship God and to receive the blessings, the graces that we need to help us to be happy in this life and to overcome our sinful inclinations. I think the events are important for the youth, uh, getting together and praising God and, and the music and the lights and all that is very attractive to them. Um, I think that's the problem is that it's not a problem, it's what I feel, is that they feel that that's the highest or the peak of the Catholic faith. And unfortunately, what you, whatever you, or not unfortunately, that's what it is. That, what you found at that event, is not going to be replicated in your parish. Mm -hmm. Because at parishes, we don't have the sound systems and the lights and the bands and the preachers. And I don't think they, they hire professional people who are public speakers mm -hmm. and things like that. And then when you go to the parish and you see, you find things boring. But it's because we're not at a, at a retreat or what they call here is a, a youth event. We are at a holy sacrifice. We are at the holy mass. Um, so it is important that taking from that peak that you fell on that faith uh, exercise in that retreat or conference, you can develop a relationship with Christ. And that has to be done at the parish level and at the personal level at home. The person who asks the question has an advantage. It's a person who's concerned about the spiritual growth of their their kids, of his or her kids, which is good. Um, now, my what I would do if I were you is, if you find these events in your area, send your kids. It's very good to go. It's very good to see the preaching and to see the praise and all the worship. It's just a different form of manifestation of the faith of the church. However, um, it's also important to, to have the elements to talk about God with your kids or you, your, your sons or daughters. Um, and for that, I would say what, because the person has a question about, about books and apps that we can recommend. Um, there are plenty of books. I don't know if the youth reads enough to finish a book, but yes, we can recommend some books apps, uh, YouTube channels, things like that are important. If they ask you questions, mm -hmm. do it. Send them these things your yeah, way. We're, we're going to talk about that, but uh, you mentioned some of these events that young people go to. So we have them in Toronto. I think it's called Steubenville, Toronto. And, um, Rise Up. Rise Up. Rise Up. Was various yes, youth events. Yes, yeah. and they're very entertaining and things like that. But the good thing about these things is you have a lot of youth together. So the youth are witnessing to each other because they see other youth practicing their faith, worshiping. It's kind of in a different context, that's true, but it, it's a reminder how important peer pressure is. And remember, peer pressure is not your peers pressuring you to do something, but it's the pressure from within to want to be accepted by your peers. And this is very important that we think about this. So why do youth dress and act a certain way? And, and all the things that they're interested in because their peers are interested in those things and, and they dress that way. They, they speak that way or whatever. So it's a desire to be accepted, to be loved. And they say even with very young children, the number one desire for many young children is to be loved with, by their parents, to spend more time with their parents, to be loved, to know that they are loved. And hopefully most young children do, but a lot of parents are so busy they don't have time to show enough love to their children and their children are kind of starving for love. When they get older, they seek that love less from their parents, more from their peers. As they get older, they seek it from a significant other, which might lead to marriage. But we are made for love and we desire love. Now, if, if you know, let's say, even we think of romantic love, if someone of the opposite sex is very attracted to you and that person is very handsome or good looking and has a wonderful personality and has self-control, it's very flattering. In other words, not just anyone, but let's say the most ideal person you can think of 
loves you. You would feel totally honored. But the reality is it's not a, just a human person, but it's God. We can say a human person in the person of Jesus Christ, the Blessed Virgin Mary. They love you. And it's important that you realize that you are loved by God. How much does he love you? So much that he would give his life for you, that he did give his life for you, that he suffered on the cross for you. No other human being would ever do anything to that extent for you. So you are extremely loved, and you need to realize that. Exactly. So there is, again, the immaterial love that will last forever until the end of time. It's, 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 it's amazing. The love of God is very difficult to explain for those who really feel it and are aware. Everybody is loved by God. I yeah. profoundly believe that. Yeah, and having good peer support is very important. So associating with like-minded youths who are practicing their faith. They also recommend, not just for youth, but for adults also, is to read the lives of the saints. So a good book is like a friend. So you mentioned earlier that young people don't tend not to read books. Sometimes they read bad books. Um, but there's a lot of lives of the saints. And ideally, the saints should become our models for how to live our lives. And there's many young saints. You know, even St. Therese of Lisieux, she was quite young when she died. Yeah. She was only 25, I think, when, when she died. So she was quite a young saint. But there are others. Um, uh, Giorgio Frassati. Giorgio Frassati, which is a young, a young, yeah. a young student. I think he developed a list of um, websites, and then uh, okay. yes, he's quite yeah. right. Um, so, in regards to what books we could recommend, well, if you recall, not too long ago, I gave a talk on on faith or reasons for us to believe, and the primary source I was using is a book called. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And it's written by Norman Geisler and Frank Turek. So the book is, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. So this would be a book for someone who doesn't even believe in God. And the book is written in very easy to understand language, but it utilizes modern day science. So when someone says the church is not relevant, the church is up on science, the church is up on statistics, and so the church is very relevant. It's not just like we're looking at old ancient documents, no. We look at what's happening today also, and we, we utilize modern day information. The book is not written by Catholics, so they are non-Catholic Christians, and so some of the things that they write I wouldn't agree with, for example, they say, oh, well, the miracles were only when God was establishing the church or revealing something new. Whereas for us as Catholics, we would say, no, miracles are throughout the centuries in the true church of God, which is the Catholic church. We have way more miracles than any other Christian group or, or religious group. Not just like they have, you know, if we were to compare, they might have, you know, on a scale of one to 100, they might have like five, whereas we have like 99% miracles in, in the Catholic Church. Uh, they also talk about the brothers of Jesus, whereas we would say they're the cousins of Jesus. Few other things that they weren't quite right on, but it's very logical, very easy to read, and very, very scientific. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. Even if you're not an atheist, it's, it's good to know about. The other thing that I would recommend for young people to read is the New Testament. Okay, uh, to read it on their own. Another good book that was recommended by someone I'm not familiar with it is, it's called Rediscovering Catholicism, and it's by Matthew Kelly. He's a very good uh, Catholic layperson. He goes around giving talks. He's written a number of books, but it's called Rediscovering Catholicism. And another very good book is called Mother Teresa, A Portrait, and it's by Father Leo Masberg. It's M-A-A-S-B-U-R-G. And it's not just about Mother Teresa, but what it means to be a Catholic. So I, I think it's a book that would appeal to young people also. I think the stories of that book are very good because they're not that long, and then they put Catholicism in a nutshell for you. Yeah. And, and the thing about that book is it's more relevant. In other words, people are familiar with Mother Teresa. She didn't die that long ago. In regards to apps, uh, one app that I particularly like is it's Catholic Answers Live. 
and there's different uh, speakers on there. One that I particularly like, it's called Open Forum with Jimmy Aiken. And Jimmy Aiken, he's a convert to Catholicism. I believe he was an atheist, mm -hmm. but he's extremely intelligent. He's like a walking encyclopedia. And people can call in with any question that they have, and he gives amazing answers. Very intelligent. He's very answers. passionate about the yeah. topic, and he knows a lot. Yeah. Um, I personally like EWTN also. There may be things there for young people. I'm not 100% sure. One of the things that I like, and I don't really have time to watch it, is Father Spitzer's Universe. And it's a very scientific approach to, uh, you know, the, the universe and, and reasons for, for showing that the universe could not have come about by chance. So he's a philosopher, Father Spitzer. Uh, he's actually blind now, so he usually wears uh, sunglasses when he speaks. But Is this on EWTN? It's on EWTN. Okay. It's a specific program, and it just talks about philosophical truths and, and things like that, and it's very good. In regards to various people on YouTube, so young people like YouTube, and especially if it's short and sweet, so there's a lot of priests who are excellent speakers, they're very short and very speak. And theologically sound. Theologically sound. The one that I would very highly recommend is Father Mike Schmitz. And it's on Ascension Press. Yeah. Ascension Presents Media. So he gives like maybe 10 minute talk max. But he appeals to the youth. He's very athletic. He's very good looking, very handsome. He's got a beautiful smile. And he's, a, he's very intelligent, very good speaker. And young people love him. So I, I would highly, highly recommend Father Mike Schmitz. Another good priest is Father Mark Goring. He too has little short uh, video presentations. He's a member of the Companions of the Cross. He's, Canadian. he's based in Canada, in Ottawa. Yeah, he's well. very good also. And recently, um, it was actually Roberto who introduced me to this other priest. It's a, a Franciscan. It's a Friar Casey Cole. And I think it's called Breaking the Habit. That's his YouTube channel. It's called Breaking the Habit. And I think he has very good uh, videos. He, very theologically sound. He YouTube. seems to do his research well. And he's, his presentations are amazing. They're very succinct and, and very well presented. Uh, yeah. I think very highly of him. And actually the tone of voice I think is appealing as well to, to the youth. Because it's very quick. Like, right. Yeah. As I said before, the attention span is very short at those ages. We want something quick so they can yeah. read and understand it. And yeah. uh, You know, a lot of young people watch Netflix. There is something called Pure Flix. And Pure Flix is only Christian content. It's not Catholic, but there's a lot of excellent movies on there. I believe you have to pay for it, but it's called Pure Flix. So that's also very good. In regards to young people here, as I mentioned, it's important for them to have good peer support. There's something called Spiritus Via, and it's a movement from the youth office of the Archdiocese to get young people together before the pandemic lockdowns. They were meeting in different churches. They, they had like question and answers. They had presentations. They had youth events. It's a wonderful thing. So that's something you might want to look into also. They're doing things online right now. So it's called Spiritus Via, which is Latin for the way of the, of the spirit. spirit. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I think, um, I think it's very important that first you keep talking about Christ to your children and, uh, Hopefully these resources will help support you in your journey. It is a very secular society, but it's also a... Um, um, it's not only secular, I feel that, which is different from other developed nations like the United States. People keep religion here to themselves and never share about it outside of their households. Um, and... Uh, when I first came to Canada years ago, one thing that really surprised me was that um, if you drive in the United States, you find big signs that says Jesus will come or Jesus will be back soon or Jesus is coming is what it says. Jesus is coming and things like that. I mean, here it's, I've never seen one. <laughs> in yes. Examples like that, it makes you feel that you're in a very secular, but also a very um, 
individualistic society in terms of faith. So that makes it very hard. Yeah, our, 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 our culture is using, losing the religious sense, mm -hmm. the religious reality. So back in Panama, the culture was very religious, which was good. Mm -hmm. America is, is a lot of places are much more religious than here. Mm -hmm. Not so much Catholicism, but certainly the Protestantism. You know, in Alabama, where they have EW10, very Catholic. So even some areas that are very, very Catholic. But here in Canada, it's kind of like watered down. And the peer pressure is affecting not just youth, but even adults. And adults are afraid to publicly manifest their faith. Yeah. So just a reminder that in regards to relevance, we are all say seeking the same thing, and that is happiness. The difference is that young people believe their happiness consists in certain things. Uh, older people who are wiser say, no, you're a little bit mistaken. It's more these things. And so it's important to consider for youth what the adults have to say. And it's always good to be open because, you know, even in the Bible, it says, check everything by means of the spirit, test things by means of the spirit. So we, we are called to be happy. And the church their primary objective is to lead us to happiness here and now and to eternal happiness. And often that's not emphasized enough. I agree. Okay. All right. Father, long questions, long answers, but yeah. hopefully it will help you. Check out the videos and check out also the books. Um, we thank you for your questions again. We thank you for all the time you're taking for writing them and send them to us. We still are a little bit behind. We have more questions to answer. Um, but hopefully uh, the lockdown will finish soon. Even if it finishes and we can open our churches, uh, rest assured that we're going to answer all the questions. Uh, thank you and may God bless you. Thank, thank you, you, Father. Thank you.